Hello and welcome everybody. We are here with a, another PowerPoint video because I have reached 500 subscribers or close to it, depending on when I decide to release this video. And for that, we are going to be going over Karn Amulet in explicit detail or as explicit as I felt was necessary. So if you are completely new to Amulet or Karn Amulet in particular, then this video is for you. We'll be covering a lot of the intricacies of Karn Amulet and why it's something that we should be talking about in the first place. And of course, as I said before in a previous video, I will also be releasing a similar PowerPoint content video on Elvish Reclaimer and Amulet. So Reclaimer, Amulet. And if you want to see that, then that link will be in the description below. But don't go watch that until you finish this video right here because this is going to be an interesting one. So let's jump straight into it. So first of all, what the heck are we talking about? Why are we covering Karn the Great Creator at all? What does this card even do? Well, the reason why this is an important topic to discuss when it comes to Annual Titan is that Karn the Great Creator has spawned its own kind of subclass or subgenre, I suppose you could say, of Amulet Titan decks. And there's a good reason for that. And because of this and the differences that the Karn lists have from the regular Amulet list, we'll see different choices in cards and different choices in sideboard cards and things along those lines. So, like I said, in this video, we're going to cover what Karn does for Amulet, what it adds to the deck. We're going to cover why Karn is played at all and uh, some reasons you, you might choose not to play Karn, as well as changes you might make to the stock, quote-unquote, amulet list in order to accommodate playing Karn, and how you should go about sideboarding when Karn is in your deck list. And then finally, I'll wrap it up with a couple of example deck lists that I think are very typical for Karn lists. So, moving forward, of course, if you're not familiar with Amulet Titan already, then you do need to pause this video and jump to another one, I have a link in the description of a video entitled, So You Want to Play Annual Titan, and that is a video that covers all of the things that you need to know about the deck Annual Titan, including the basics and all the cards that are involved in playing that deck. Of course, I don't, I don't see how you could have a basis of understanding for a Karn Amulet without actually knowing what Annual Titan is, so if you need to check out that video, then the link is in the description below, and I'm going to assume that we all have an operating knowledge of Annual Titan in general. So... Before we get into any specifics about Karn the Great Creator, I thought it would be a good idea to just kind of take a look at the general perspective on Karn the Great Creator. And without looking in too much detail, what are some interesting things to note about this card? First of all, Karn is a four mana planeswalker, and uh, four mana is a little expensive for modern, but it's not so expensive that it's difficult to cast. And in fact, in Amulet, when we're getting up to six mana routinely, even by as early as turn three, four mana is not a whole lot. Um, and so, hence why I put here that Amulet can play him on turn 3 pretty easily, as you're trying to play a turn 3 6 drop. But, at the earliest, you can in fact play Karn on turn 2. That would be a draw that involves something like 2 amulets and a bounce land, or like an amulet, a grazer, or a Zeusa, a bounce land, and a Karn, of course. And, so, we're looking at a 4 mana planeswalker here that we can play on turn 2, turn 3, you know, generally. Even if you just had a turn 2 explore, you could play a turn 3 Karn generally. So, that's what we're looking at. And... It's important to note that Karn starts out at 5 loyalty, so you can either plus him up to 6 or a minus 2 down to 3. If you do choose to plus, then Karn is not going to die to your opponent's removal spells like Lightning Bolt, you know, direct damage spells, that kind of thing, like Boros Charm or um, Lightning Helix kind of things. But it will, in fact, die to a Delirium to Unholy Heat, whether you minus or plus. And of course, if it does die to Bolt, well, you got a card out of it anyways for the minus 2 ability. So... And another thing to note here is that Karn is completely colorless, meaning that when your opponent slams a Blood Moon, or if you just happen to get caught on mana sources, Karn is easy to cast. Any four mana will do, and that means that Karn is good against a Blood Moon and Mages in the Moon. It also means that Karn cannot be hit by common Amulet Titan hate, like Aether Gust, that sort of thing. And then, of course, the last thing to note here is, as a Planeswalker, Karn has both a plus and a minus ability, meaning that you can alternate the two and you can keep Karn around for multiple turns and continue to get value out of Karn, either through his plus or his minus, and in theory, he would never have to leave the table. So Karn is kind of a, a nice sticky thing that does, or a nice sticky threat that does a lot of things. And now that we've looked from a general perspective, let's start talking about the specifics about Karn and what exactly it is that Karn does in general, uh, and also specifically for Amulet. So the first thing that I want to talk about when it comes to talking about Karn's abilities is... Karn's minus two, which reads, you may choose an artifact card you own from outside the game or an exile, reveal that card and put it into your hand. And of course, in a competitive context, outside of the game is referring to your sideboard, 
Um, that's in competitive context. In a casual context, it would be from anywhere. But of course, for a competitive perspective, this is just going to be anything you can get out of your sideboard. And of course, exile as well, which is actually very relevant. Um, and so what, uh, what exactly does this do for us, right? Minus two to tutor for something from your sideboard means that if you pack your sideboard with a couple of interesting artifact cards that are good targets for Karn, then you have a little bit of a, a, a Karn board is what it's called, a little, a little pocket of cards in your sideboard that are put there specifically for your Karn, and that way you can minus two for them given different scenarios that they would be useful. So, of course, I've got a couple pictured here, but we're going to go into those in more detail, and so let's go ahead and start touching on some of the important Karn minus two targets. And the first one is liquid metal coating. This is uh, the very first obvious thing to talk about when it comes to Karn. But unfortunately, without uh, any of the context of the rest of the card, you know, without talking about his plus one and its passive ability, then we can't really talk in detail about coating as of right now, because right now coating, as far as you know, is just a two mana artifact that taps to make a permanent into an artifact. And uh, without knowing the rest of Karn, it's not obvious what this is going to do. So we're going to cover this one in more detail in the future. But just to give you a general idea right now, coding is used to kill opponents' lands. It deactivates planeswalkers or other permanents. Um, and again, like I said, we'll cover that in more detail. But I did want to touch on it first because it is the most important Karn target. But uh, moving forward, Karn minus two also allows you to find various pieces of graveyard hate. Uh, this can include cards like Relic of Progenitus that have a one-time or uh, maybe a semi-consistent graveyard hate with a one-time activ activation ability. Things like Relic of Progenitus, Lantern of the Lost, things along those lines. It can also find things like Tormod's Crypt, a very common one in the Karn sideboard, and uh, Graf Graf Digger's Cage as well. All these cards are targeted at specifically dealing with our opponent's graveyards. And this is a useful thing to be able to minus for because uh, in this sense, any amulet deck that's playing Karn is now able to interact in a different way with combo strategies that involve the graveyard. This includes Reanimator or Living In, things that are trying to either en masse or targetedly bring creatures back from the graveyard or anything for that matter. It doesn't have to be creatures. Um, it also will affect matchups like Storm, where they're trying to recast all of their cards from the graveyard in order to do a big combo thing all in one turn with the card Past in Flames, which I've mentioned here in parentheses. Um, this type of hate, especially Tormod's Crypt, because it costs zero, is extremely effective against these strategies. It lets you play a Karn, minus for something to interact with your opponent, and uh, continue with your game plan after that, while your opponent has to deal with this hate that usually Amulet doesn't have access to, especially in Game 1. So, in that way, the uh, Karn Amulet lists are able to interact with Graveyard decks in a way that the typical Amulet lists are not really able to do. Um, so that's one of the benefits of playing Karn. It also will give us a bit of a tool against opponents playing things like Delve Threats, Murktide Regent, for example, or anything that's Graveyard Reliant, like Delirium, or um, right now, this is a really hot topic, but like recurring things from your graveyard with Luris, which may or may not be legal by the time this video comes out, so we'll see. Um, but for those reasons, having at least Tormod's Crypt is a standard inclusion for your Karn sideboard targets, the Karn board, and um, it's it's common to see things like Relic in the sideboard, but generally those are going to be brought in after game one as good main deck tools. Tormod's Crypt isn't really worth a card for the effect, so it's usually left in the sideboard, even in games two and three, just to have that easy to cast, easy to find, you know, just play Karn, no mana floating, minus for Crypt, and play it immediately, and then you have your Graveyard Hate available. So this is a standard inclusion for your Karn board for obvious reasons. Moving on to the next topic, Karn boards typically contain some variety of additional threats, uh, be it a Worm Coil Engine or a Golos Tireless Pilgrim or a Walking Ballista. And the reason for this is because when you play and resolve a Karn, not only can you minus for several utility artifacts on the sideboard, but you can also minus for something to actually win the game with, as Karn himself doesn't usually win the game on his own. So being able to minus for a Worm Coil Engine or a Walking Ballista to start attacking your opponent and kind of ending, close, closing that door, making sure that they can't uh, kill you faster than you can kill them. Uh, that's one thing that Karn is used for. In particular, Worm Coil Engine tends to be the, I would say, the number one just like big threat that is present in Karn board, specifically for ending the game. And uh, that's because not only is Worm Coil big as a 6-mana six 6-6, six, six, with a relevant couple of abilities in Lifelink primarily and Death Touch as well, but... Worm Coil Engine also replaces itself with several tokens when it dies, so that makes it useful against grindier decks as well. And of course, Worm Coil Engine is a colorless threat, just like Karn himself. So even through an opponent's Blood Moon, 
if you can land a Karn and minus Worm Coil Engine and then play Worm Coil Engine, regardless of the fact that you can no longer cast any green spells, most likely thanks to your opponent's Blood Moon, now you can just start turning Worm Coil Engine sideways and try to end the game that way, and that can be very useful. In addition, uh, you usually see, almost always, one copy of Walking Ballista in the Karn sideboard, and that is because it allows you to do direct damage to your opponent once a Ballista is on the board. Um, you can always pay for to put plus one, plus one counters on it, but it also lets you interact with your opponent's creatures and planeswalkers, which we'll cover in a uh, additional slide here when we get to a, one of the next, uh, I guess, portions of the Karn board. And then finally, you do occasionally see a copy of Golos Tireless Pilgrim, or as well, I've seen Essica's Chariot. These are just additional, like, kind of mid-rangey, like, threats that you can play before you have Titan mana type things. So, like, Golos is going to let you search for a land and put it into play and has a relevant activated ability. Um, Eska's Chariot is just a nice threat that generates additional tokens and accrues value after that. So, that's the type of thing you might see in a Karn board. As well as an artifact land such as Treasure Vault or Darksteel Citadel. These are typically seen in the sideboard for just a couple very niche usages, but... In my opinion, having access to an artifact land in the sideboard is very useful, not only for hitting six lands to activate your Dryad and Valkut to start doing some damage with all of your newly made mountains, I suppose you could say, with Dryad, um, but also it's pretty common to have a hand that has a Karn and has some intermediary, you know, ramp pieces or whatever, but doesn't have quite enough lands to get to Titan, and then you top deck the Titan, and you just need to get a land, and Karn being on the minus for a Treasure Vault or Dark Seer's Darksteel Citadel will become very handy in those types of scenarios. Uh, and having played one of these cards in my sideboard with various Karn lists, I can tell you personally that you might think that this doesn't come up that often, but in my experience, it definitely most certainly does come up. And I've won several games just because I had a Artifact Land in my sideboard for Karn to minus four. So that's one thing you might see. Additionally, every Karn board pretty much includes some amount of board interaction, be it a Pithy Needle to deactivate one of your opponent's threats, like Yawgmoth Thran Physician is the number one target for this, but as well as things like Inkmoth Nexus, Goblin Charbelter, Planeswalkers, that kind of thing, obviously. Anything that has activated abilities that you'd want to turn off, Pithy Needle's there for it. As well, you'll almost always see copies of Engineered Explosives, which Karn can, in fact, minus for, because that is an artifact. Usually, these will come in in game two and three, uh, when Karn is boarded out, but at least in game one, you'll be able to minus four explosives with your Karn in order to kind of sweep up the battlefield and keep that under control. Um, you'll also occasionally see things like Sky Sovereign Console Flagship, one of my favorite cards to play with Karn because I find it to be very fun. Um, but things like these, uh, that and Walking Ballista are typically there for purposes of killing your opponent's opposing, like, random creatures that are really annoying. So, for example, your opponent resolves the Magus of the Moon, you can minus four Sky Sovereign or for Ballista in order to play them and do some damage to the Magus, and all of a sudden there's no Magus in the Moon to worry about anymore. This also applies to things like Archon of Amaria, Meddling Mage, any kind of annoying single creature threat, Sky Sovereign and Ballista will take care of it for you, and as well, Sky Sovereign actually serves as multiple potential usages, uh, since you can, even if you have no other creatures, you can use Karn's Plus ability, which we'll see later, to turn your Sky Sovereign into a creature itself, and then attack with it, and it will still trigger to do the three damage, so Sky Sovereign is kind of repeatable removal in that sense. Um, you'll also see sometimes, very seldomly, uh, something like an ensnaring bridge that turns off all combat for your opponent and for yourself as well, um, because sometimes just shutting down big creatures like Death Shadow or whatever uh, against Tron opponents maybe, uh, but mainly against like Death Shadow players or opposing Primeval Titan players, sometimes getting an ensnaring bridge can be useful. It's not that common though. And of course, the Karn board is also very popular because you can choose whatever you want. This is just a short kind of list of cards that I've seen just looking over various random lists listed on NTG Top 8. These are all the most reasonable artifacts that I haven't really covered a whole lot in detail, um, but have actually seen play in placing lists in the past. I did a deep dive of many different Karn amulet lists looking for inspiration for what types of artifacts to talk about, and all of these have seen play at some point in time or another, even if they're not that common necessarily. So if there's any artifact that you're partial to, and you can minus Karn for it, then feel free to do what you want. It's always a pleasure to be able to minus for something that is useful in whatever situation it is that you're in. So these are always cards that will 
potentially come up in the future. And of course, any other artifact that gets printed is only going to make Karn better for the uh, ability of giving you more options, right? So that's one other good thing about the Karn board is that as time goes on, being able to minus for something from your sideboard can only get better and better. So let's move to the next ability of Karn, as that was just the minus two that we were covering. So Karn also has a plus ability that reads, until your next turn, up to one target non-creature artifact becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness equal to its converted mana cost. And this particular ability of Karn is almost entirely revolving around tricky rules interactions. So the first and primary example of this is if your opponent has a zero mana artifact that is not a creature already, you can plus one to turn it into a creature. And of course, its power and toughness are both going to be equal to zero because that's its mana cost, and it dies immediately due to state-based effects. So, for example, your opponent plays a Chalice of the Void or any other artifact that has an X in the cost and is not already a creature. Then when you plus it, the X is going to be considered to be zero, so it'll kill it immediately. So, of course, having a card plus one on your opponent's Chalice of the Void that's trying to shut off your Summoner's Pack since they played Chalice on zero or whatever... That can be very impactful, and Karn gets value against these types of zero mana artifacts immediately just by plussing, um, so that can be very good. And, of course, if your opponent is running artifact lands like Darksteel Citadel, you can plus one on their artifact land to turn it into a zero zero creature and it'll die. So against Affinity, the plus one ability can sometimes be very powerful. And this is where Liquid Metal, uh, liquid metal Coating comes back, and we can talk about one of the modes of Liquid Metal Coating that is very useful when it comes to Karn, which is tapping Liquid Metal Coating to make your opponent's land an artifact in addition to its other types. And then you plus one Karn on the land that you targeted with Coating, and since it's now an artifact, it'll be animated into a 0-0 zero, zero creature and die. So of course, by minusing for Coating, the turn after you can play Coating, target one of their lands, and plus one on Karn to kill it, and just kill a land every turn from that point on if you so desire. And that can be very powerful. Um, so Liquid Metal Coating is very good against opposing big mana decks like Tron or Amulet for, the, for that reason. It's good against Control because it limits your opponent's mana, uh, stopping them from playing multiple spells a turn while you still make progress. And a couple of other interesting rules intricacies about Karn's plus one. If you plus one Karn on any equipment that's already attached to a creature, say like a Colossus Hammer, for example, is a big one. Um, you plus one on their Colossus Hammer and an equipment that becomes animated into a creature cannot be attached to another creature. Creatures just can't be attached to creatures. So what happens is the equipment that you plus on, say it's a Colossus Hammer, becomes unattached from whatever it was previously equipped to and is now just its own creature. At the beginning of your next turn, it'll turn back into an artifact. Um, but then it is susceptible to one of the other abilities of Karn, which we'll talk about. But you can plus one on an equipment to detach it uh, from a creature that it's equipped to. So you can plus one on a Cauldra to make it a 7-7 for a turn and get rid of the germ token. For example, you can do this with Batter Skull, you can do this with Cranial Plating. Any equipment that sees play is susceptible to a Karn plus one under the right conditions. And then, of course, there's also the tech ability of plussing on your opponent's artifact, like a Damping Sphere or whatever, some annoying artifact in a Snaring Bridge, just so that you can use something that interacts with a creature in order to kill that artifact. So, like, your opponent has an annoying Ensnaring Bridge, and you happen to bring in Dismember, say you're, they're playing, like, Eldrazi Tron or something, you can animate their ensnaring bridge into a creature. You can dismember the ensnaring bridge and get rid of it. And that is one way to have additional outs against sometimes problematic cards like ensnaring bridge and damping sphere and, you know, things along those lines. So now the final ability of Karn, the passive ability, which is always active, it reads activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. And so. Basically, if your opponent controls any artifacts, they're not going to be able to do anything, including tap for mana. So it just automatically deactivates your opponent's artifact lands, and it stops equip abilities from, from equipment. It stops, you know, your opponent's liquid metal coatings, like tap to activate abilities, all that kind of thing. Um, so because of this effect, Karn is quite effective against various artifact-based strategies. For example, opponents trying to utilize Mishra's Bobble and Treasure Tokens, those can be affected by Karn, even though it's not the main usage of Karn. And those matchups. It also turns off opponents' Aether Vials, where they're trying to tap this artifact to put in creatures. Well, they can't do that anymore. Um, it, like I said, it's also very good against equipment. So, of course, for example, you could, like, plus one on your opponent's Colossus Hammer, and that'll make it into a 1-1 that's no longer attached to any other creature. And then, once it becomes a artifact again, they'll no longer be able to equip it, even if they had something like a Pure Steel Paladin to reduce the cost all the way to zero. It doesn't matter, because the equip ability is an activated ability of your opponent's equipment. So, that's another reason why Karn is very good against equipment decks in specific. Um, but this also affects various things like Oblivion Stone, Chromatic Stars and Spheres and Exhibition Naps against opposing Tron opponents. So 
Again, anything playing equipment is just very susceptible to Karn in general. And, of course, like I mentioned, Liquid Metal Coating comes back again for this ability as well, because if you activate coating on something during your opponent's turn and turn it into an artifact until end of turn, then Karn will deactivate that permanent until end of turn because it's an artifact, right? So you activate coating on your opponent's land because you couldn't, let's say you minus for coating and play it immediately, but you can't use Karn again. Well, then on your opponent's upkeep, you can tap coating and turn one of their lands into an artifact, and it won't be dead, but it still won't be able to tap for mana as that is an activated ability. So you can turn off, quote-unquote, one of your opponent's lands temporarily. You can also do this to Planeswalkers, so your opponent has a Teferi Time Raveler, let's say, or a Teferi Hero of Dominaria or a Jason the Mind Sculptor. You can, on their upkeep, tap coating to turn their Planeswalker into an artifact, and then their loyalty abilities, you know, plus one, minuses, or whatever they are, whatever they might be, zero abilities, those are all activated abilities as well, so it'll deactivate your opponent's Planeswalkers. Literally anything that has an activated ability, you can deactivate it with coding. Um, so that's one of the other uses of Karn as well. So to summarize some of the benefits of Karn, just to kind of put a nice little pin in this particular topic, Karn is allowing us to interact with combo decks, uh, specifically graveyard-centric combo decks, or artifact-based combo decks, uh, anything that's weak to Pithy Needle from the sideboard, anything that's weak to Karn's passive ability against artifacts, or to Tormod's Crypt slash other Grave Hate that we have in the sideboard for Karn specifically, Karn is going to help us in those matchups, and that can be a very broad um, spectrum of effects. So like Belcher, Storm, opponents playing Tron lands, you know, Amulet, anything that can be weak to those types of things that we can search for with Karn, or just to his passive ability, Karn will improve those matchups dramatically. Karn also is a grindy and easy-to-cast threat, so if your opponent's playing a black-green mid-range deck, for example, you can play Karn and minus to get either a threat or an engineered explosives or something to interact with them, and then they still have to deal with the Karn, while also dealing with the fact that he just gained you a card. So against grindy matchups, especially if Karn sticks around, he can do a lot of work in grindy matchups or control matchups where you want additional threats to cast to try to run your opponent out of counter magic or whatever. So, in those types of very grindy, you know, card-oriented matchups, Karn is very good. And then, another thing to note is, at least in Game 1, Karn helps us to beat otherwise difficult to deal with hate cards. So, like, if your opponent's playing mainboard Blood Moons or whatever, then being able to cast Karn against that Blood Moons, like against Ponza, for example, and minus for things to interact, or even a Magus on the Moon, which is typically very hard for Amulet to deal with, having Karn lets you deal with it a lot easier, since you can just minus for a Walking Ballista and play through it. So against kind of like prison decks or Blood Moon decks or anything like that, uh, Karn helps us in game one. Um, Karn can also minus two for answers to annoying cards like Meddling Mage, uh, Magus and Moon, as I mentioned. So anything annoying that your opponent could have that might be difficult for Amulet to beat otherwise, Karn will help us potentially beat it, including things like Chalice of the Void since you can plus to kill it. Um, and then, of course, just in general, against any artifact deck, Karn is going to be fantastic as not only does his passive completely invalidate their whole strategy, but the plus one can also make their non-creature artifacts targets for our removal or Valka triggers. So Karn is very good against artifact decks, including decks like Hammer Time, which seem to be very aggressive, but are reliant on artifacts. So that is an example of one of the benefits of playing Karn. So we've talked about all this great stuff that Karn can do and how Karn helps us. But of course, we have to mention what is the catch you know, if, if all this stuff is great, then why isn't everybody playing Karn? What are some of the downsides of playing Karn? And first of all, Karn, being a Planeswalker in a deck like Amulet that doesn't have very many creatures, is very susceptible to opponents who are attacking Karn. So, like, if your opponent just plays a turn one creature, that can be sometimes very annoying for a Karn deck because you have to be able to play your Karn and keep it in play to get value out of it, right? So, Karn requires that you find some way to protect it against opponent's creature decks or... It can just be weak against creature decks as well. That's possible. Additionally, Karn is kind of slow. Against some aggro decks, being able to cast Karn for four mana is still just too slow. Like, you tap out on your turn three to minus for something to interact with them, and then you just immediately die <laughs> during their turn, either a turn three or turn four kill, which is very common in modern. So Karn is relatively slow in that sense. Um, Karn also leads to clunkier opening hands. So, like, hands that have a couple lands, like a Summoner's Pact, a Primeval Titan, and a Karn. It's not obvious how fast that hand will be, depending on whether you top deck additional things like amulets or ramp spells. So, like, sometimes 
it leads to very difficult mulligan decisions as well because you don't know how good Karn will be. You don't know if he'll top deck like ramp or something like that. And you could also keep hands that will have Karn as a top end threat, but no Titan, and then just never draw a Titan and your Karn is just not not enough to get there. And that can happen as well. So sometimes playing Karn can clunk up your hands. And then, of course, when we're playing all these artifacts in the sideboard that we want to minus Karn for, this is also going to eat up our sideboard space for cards that we otherwise would have there. Like, for example, if you wanted to play a copy of Tireless Tracker, if you're using, you know, four out of 15 cards to make room for Karn targets, then that's four less cards you can fit in. You may not be able to play the Tireless Tracker that you want to play, or any other card for that matter. So, and I would say that if you're playing Karn, it's going to take at least four cards. I discussed this with a MTGO user named Punt Then Wine, who is just probably, I would say, the best Karn amulet player that exists at this point in time. Punt, uh, Punt Then Wine has had a lot of success with Karn, more so than probably any other person that I know. So, of course, I went and reached out to Punt Then Wine for a little bit of help in creating this PowerPoint. And we came to the conclusion that the very bare minimum you should be playing if you're playing Karn is a Engineered Explosives, a Walking Ballista, a Tor Mod Script, and a Liquid Metal Coating in your sideboard. At least those four are necessary for making Karn the powerhouse that it can be. And so, for all these reasons, like weakness to aggressive decks and being slow, Karn is going to make your deck significantly worse against decks like Burn and Prowess, where you have Karns that you're playing that are weak to your opponent's strategy. All of a sudden, your game one becomes a little a little worse, and you have to deal with the downsides of Karn in games two and three. You have to, or at least you have to recoup that disadvantage. So Karn can be very bad depending on the meta that you're playing against. So it does come with some detriment despite all the uh, benefits that you get from playing Karn. So that brings me to the question, how is it that we accommodate Karn, right? So we've talked about some of Karn's weaknesses. And of course, Karn itself has to be fit into the deck of Amulet. So what are some ways that we change the Amulet deck list to make Karn work, right? And the first way is playing a maximum number of Arboreal Grazers, the one mana 0 3 with the ETB ability that puts it on land. If you've ever played Amulet, this card should be very familiar to you. And right now, with Ragaman in the format, every list, even the ones that are not playing Karn, are playing four copies of Arboreal Grazer. And arguably, Grazer might just be better than Soccer Tribe Scout. It's not super clear, but there was a point in time where playing Grazer over Soccer Tribe Scout was not very common. And I could see that happening again in the future, depending on how modern evolves. So, of course, if it would be better to play Scout than Grazer. If you're playing Karn, this is going to pretty much require you to play four Arboreal Grazers instead, because Grazer is efficient at blocking your opponent's attacking creatures, and it also enables you to play turn two or turn three Karns very easily. Um, sometimes Scout does not help you with that. So when you're playing Karn, playing four Arboreal Grazers, in my opinion, is an absolute requirement. Also, since Castle Garenbrig doesn't help you cast your Karns, it's typically one of the cuts in order to make room for your Karns in the main deck. In addition to this, in order to make room for Karn, you also will see a movement of various types of utility lands to the sideboard. This could include Bajuka Bog or Ghost Quarter or Radiant Fountain, Cavernous Souls, any of those like utility lands that you might otherwise search for with, with Primeval Titan, since you have to make room for Karn and your, you know, some of the card choices that you're playing. These can be subject to removal from the main deck, and sometimes they're allotted to the sideboard, sometimes they're missing entirely. Um, but in particular, I like to move things like Radiant Fountain and extra copies of Ghost Quarter to the sideboard when I'm playing Karn. Sometimes I just don't even play the extra copies of whatever, or especially Radiant Fountain. I found myself cutting Radiant Fountain a lot. So if you're playing Karn, be prepared to shave some of the quote-unquote sacred cows when it comes to Amulet. Um, Karn amulet lists, particularly Punt and Wines lists early on, were the very first to pioneer moving some of these lands to the sideboard back when it was unthinkable not to play Bajuka Bog and Ghost Quarter in the main deck before Urza Saga was printed. Punt and Wine and Karn lists in general were the first to pioneer that tech, and now almost every amulet deck is doing this. So, but especially if you're playing Karn, this is going to be a necessity. In addition to this, you see a trimming of copies of Explorer, as Explorer is the weakest ramp spell, I would say, in Amulet, um, and it serves more of a grindy purpose with the card draw, but obviously Karn is going to allow you to grind 
in a different way, in a better way than Explorer can. So typically, uh, Karn and Explorer are kind of competing for slots in the main deck, and you'll see some amount of trimming of Explorer, or even cutting Explorer entirely in order to make a room for Karn. Um, you'll also see some cutting of Explorer in order to play more copies of Azusa. And this is because, of course, Azusa allowing you to play multiple land drops is going to allow you to accelerate into a turn two Karn more frequently. Uh, Explorer does not do this. So, like, for example, you could play a turn one amulet and then turn two play Bounce Land, play Azusa, and play Bounce Land twice more for four mana to cast Karn. That's one way that you can cast Karn on turn two, and uh, Explorer doesn't help with that. So sometimes you'll see Explorer eschewed entirely in favor of two or three copies of Azusa instead of the one or zero that are sometimes played. In addition to all these other changes, sometimes you'll see players moving over to Hanweir Battlements rather than the Slayer Stronghold and Sunhome Haste and Double Strike package. And this is because simply just to make room for changes in the main deck. You know, if you weren't otherwise going to play four copies of Grazer, and if you're making room for four Karns, there's a lot of slots that need to get changed. And simply changing the two, the two um, Colorless Lands and the one Boros Garrison into one additional Valakut and one Hanweir can make a huge difference in making that extra room. Sometimes you'll see Karn lists playing something like Ancient Stirrings in order to find either a land or an amulet or Karn itself since it is colorless, but that's very uncommon. But I did want to mention it. And then finally, of course, if you're making room for your Karn targets on the sideboard, this is going to force you to cut weaker or more redundant cards from your sideboard. So the typical amulet, uh, the typical Karn amulet list is going to include very heavy hitting sideboard cards and cut the ones that are, I suppose, not as powerful in their application directly. So we'll cover that in a, a more detail in a future slide. So now that we've talked about some of the accommodations to the main deck, let's talk about some of the intricacies in playing Amulet with Karn, in particular sideboarding. How does playing Karn and having these Karn targets in your sideboard affect how you sideboard with Amulet in general? So first of all, like I mentioned, you're already playing only very heavy hitting Sideboard cards like Force of Vigor and Engineered Explosives. Sometimes you see Tireless Tracker for additional threats. These are the types of things that we're looking for. And since so much of our sideboard is taken up by Karn targets, typically four or five cards out of the 15, there's only going to be more minor changes. We're not going to see massive, like, bring in, you know, 11 cards, take out 11 cards. That's not really going to happen. It's going to be little, like, nudges here and there. Um, so that's one thing to note with sideboarding already is that you're going to be making very minimalistic changes. Secondly. Because we've moved some of our bullet lands to the sideboard, like Bog or Ghost Quarter, then you'll also see some very small like land pivots, like sometimes against a deck that is very controlling, you'll take out copies of Castle Garenbrig in order to bring in your extra copies of Cavernous Hold. And it seems like a very minute change, but that's the type of thing that we're dealing with when it comes to the Karn sideboard, um, when it comes to the lands. Uh, but just in general, making gradual like land improvements, like having access to Bog versus not having access access to bog whether we're playing all four copies of urza saga or not that type of thing that is very common when it comes to sideboarding with karn um, another common practice with karn that might surprise you is taking karn out entirely in favor of bringing in some of the very specific bullets that karn might otherwise look for like engineer explosives and maybe even like walking ballista or sky sovereign depending on what you're playing against um, and this is common practice specifically against those aggro decks that are already very good at pressuring Karn. So like things that can play creatures early, like Prowess and Burn, that will be able to clock your Karn very easily. Just bringing in the Engineer Explosives is much more efficient because it's better to just immediately be able to play Explosives and pop it for the two mana than it is to have to pay four mana for a Karn to minus the Karn to get the Explosives to then have to play the Explosives and activate it. It's just extremely inefficient. And so you'll sometimes see Karn boarded out in very fast, aggressive matchups or very creature-oriented matchups as well. Um, so that's one thing to mention when it comes to sideboarding. And then finally, uh, this is a more recent development. And again, I have to give credit to Pump and Wine for this particular tech. Uh, it's very common in Karn Amulet List and sometimes other Amulet Lists as well. But in particular, in Karn Amulet List, it's very common to board out copies of Amulet of Vigor against any deck that has interaction for Amulet or like Blood Moons or something along those lines where your Amulet is either not doing what's supposed to or it's making itself a huge target, particularly against these black-red decks that play Coligan's Command. Um, boarding out Amulets will allow you not only to minus for an Amulet with your Karn, which doesn't actually come up all that much, but 
because we have access to Karn and uh, therefore additional cards and more specific cards tailored to the matchup in our sideboard, being able to play Karn will help us grind if we are not as fast with the amulet not being present in the deck. So boarding out amulet in a Karn amulet deck is actually more common than you would otherwise see it in a typical amulet strategy. So this is the first of the two deck lists that we're going to look at. This is a deck list that was second place in a recent modern challenge, and it's by the user Musasabi, and this shows some of what we've been talking about when it comes to Karn Amulet. This in particular is the list that plays Hanweir Battlements, and again, like I said, you see room for the extra copy of Valkut. You see four Grazers being played to protect your Karns. You see four Karns, of course. This particular list has only three Explorers and only one Azusa, kind of splitting between the two and leaning more on Explorer, which is not a guaranteed what you should be doing in Karn Amulet. It, it's up to preference, really. Um, but uh, in the sideboard, we'll see some of the things that we talked about, like Engineered Explosives, of course, Tormod's Crypt as a Karn target, the Artifact Land. Uh, I think Moose's Hobby was the one who kind of popularized playing the Artifact Land in the Karn sideboard. Uh, Pithy Needle, Sky Sovereign, you know, extra threats and Worm Coil. Uh, the one thing that's very strange to me about this list is the lack of Walking Ballista, which I would highly suggest, but regardless, you'll see a lot of the things that we talked about in practice. Only two copies of Castle Garenbrig, for example. Um, you know, some changes to the mana base as well. So this is an example of a Karn Hanweir deck list. So if you were looking for a good starting place for a Karn list, this is what I would suggest if you want to play Hanweir. And of course, I do have a deck list for those of you who want to play with Boros Garrison, Slayer Stronghold, and Sunhome Fortress of the Legion. This is a list by none other than Pump and Wine, who I've already mentioned several times in this presentation. This particular list was taken from a recent modern challenge where Pump and Wine was able to get fourth place. And again, like I said, we see a preponderance of Arboreal Grazers. We see our four cards here, of course. This list particularly leans on Azusa more so than Explorer. Um, but again, like I said, that's up for debate. And then if we take a look at the sideboard, you'll see the typical Karn targets, including Tormod's Crypt, Walking Ballista, Liquid Metal Coating, you know, the sort of thing you would expect. So if you're looking for a good starting point when it comes to playing Karn Amulet with the typical double strike and haste package that Amulet usually plays, then I would suggest this list. And yeah, I suppose that covers everything. So. If you've gotten some information out of this PowerPoint that you didn't know otherwise or found it generally useful, then go ahead and show your support by leaving a like, sharing the video with anybody. Any comments down below are very appreciated. If you have questions about Karn Amulet or my opinions on certain strategies, uh, whether I like to play Karn personally, anything at all that you feel like commenting, then I'll be looking in the comments below. And thank you for your time watching this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Don't forget. I'm going to be making a video for Reclaimer Amulet as well, so be on the lookout for that, and I'll see you guys in the next one. This is Redface Menace, signing off.